Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another mini lecture. Um, today, we're going to talk about the federal courts, and then I'll do another short lecture, actually much shorter lecture, about state courts. Um, so the federal court system. The federal court system is established in Article Three of the Constitution. Um, Article One establishes the legislature. Article Two establishes the executive branch, and Article Three establishes the courts. Uh, the language in Article Three is actually very succinct. Um, it says the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. A couple of things that I want you to notice about this language. One is that the judicial power of the United States is not actually defined. Uh, it's pretty vague. Um, so we end up relying a lot on the Federalist Papers, and sort of a general understanding of what courts did in the late 1700s to inform our interpretation of the judicial power. Um, the other thing to note is that Article Three creates a Supreme Court but it does not create any other federal courts. Instead, they, the founders sort of passed the buck to the first Congress and said, if you guys want to make some lower courts, go for it. Uh, but the Supreme Court is the only court that the only federal court that is constitutionally mandated. In theory, Congress could simply wipe out the rest of the federal judiciary. They're not going to do that, um, but in theory, they could. So as Article 3 passes the buck to Congress, and Congress picked up the buck, as, as you would say, um, in 1789. So one of the very first things that the new Congress did um, was pass the Judiciary Act. And the Judiciary Act created uh, 13 district courts. So it, it actually created a court in each of the um, former colonies in each of the states. And then it created three circuit courts, which are courts that are intermediate courts. We'll look at this uh, again in a little bit. Uh, but these intermediate courts had kind of geographic um, boundaries. And then it established that the Supreme Court would have six justices. Um, again, while Article 3 says there will be a Supreme Court, it doesn't actually say much about what that court is going to look like. Um, the number of justices is, um, is up to statute. So as a result, the size of the Supreme Court has actually fluctuated a bit over time. Um, specifically in the 1800s, it kind of rose and fell. Um, it hit a high point when Lincoln was president. It went up to 10 justices, um, largely in order to give President Lincoln the power to add additional people to the court. Um, <clears throat> But then in 1869, um, through kind of a process of attrition, the size of the Supreme Court dropped back down to nine, or actually went up to nine, sorry. It dropped from 10 to, I think, seven, and then it went back up to nine. In any event, currently there are nine Supreme Court justices, and this has been the case since 1869, so for a very, very long time. Again, Congress could choose to change the size of the court. And every now and then they talk about that, particularly as a way to give a, a, a current president more power by giving him more vacancies to fill on the Supreme Court. Um, but so far that hasn't happened, uh, not since 1869. Um, so the current composition of the court is eight associate justices and one chief justice. Um, the chief justice is a specific position on the Supreme Court. So it's not uh, the justice who has been around the longest. 
And in fact, if the chief justice retires, it's up to the president to decide whether to appoint someone who's currently on the court to take the chief position, in which case that justice has to go through the confirmation process again, be confirmed for elevation to the status of chief. And then the, the president would be able to fill the new vacancy for an associate justice. In the alternative, when the chief resigns, um, it's also, or passes away, uh, it's also possible for the president to simply go outside of the court and pick a brand new person. Um, both methods have been used by presidents in the past. Uh, justice Roberts, who is our current chief justice, was not an associate justice first. Uh, his first position on the US Supreme Court was as chief justice. So right now we have uh, these nine justices. Uh, justice Kavanaugh is a Trump appointee. Justice Kagan is an Obama appointee. Justice Gorsuch is a Trump appointee. Justice Coney Barrett is a Trump appointee. Justice Alito is a Bush appointee, uh, specifically the second Bush. Uh, Justice Thomas is, <laughs> Justice Thomas has been around for quite some time. Uh, Justice Thomas was appointed when I was in law school, holy moly, ages ago. Um, he was appointed by the elder Bush. Um, Justice Roberts was appointed, Chief Justice Roberts was appointed by uh, the younger Bush president, George W. Bush. Justice Breyer was a Clinton appointee and Justice Sotomayor was um, an Obama appointee. So when we talk about courts, we often use this word jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is effectively the legal authority to hear a particular type of dispute. It is uh, the scope of cases that a court can hear. For federal courts, there are two basic types of jurisdiction. Federal courts have jurisdiction over cases that raise a federal question. So these would be cases that involve the application of a federal statute. Um, those could be civil cases or criminal cases, but they involve a federal statute or a case that involves the US Constitution uh, because that is a, a federal question. The federal court also has a type of jurisdiction called diversity jurisdiction. Diversity jurisdiction exists when the parties on the two sides of a dispute, the plaintiff and the defendant, are from different states. So for example, if I were in an accident, if I went up to Oklahoma City and was in a car accident and the person who hit me was from Oklahoma, potentially, I could bring my lawsuit in federal court, even though that is, an auto accident is typically a state court matter because I am a resident of Texas, I'm the plaintiff, and the other side, the defendant is a resident, a, a citizen of Oklahoma. If the amount we're fighting over is large enough, if I'm suing for $75,000 or more, then I can actually bring my case in federal court. Um, and I would encourage you to think about why we do that. Why is it that high stakes cases involving people from different states can be heard in federal court instead of state court? Um, it's not a trick question. I'm pretty sure you will very quickly see the answer. If not, that's also okay. Don't feel bad. Um, if not, uh, take it to the uh, discussion board. Okay, so let's look at the courts, what they look like now. Right now, um, the lowest federal courts where our, our sort of um, workhorse <laughs> uh, courts in the federal system are what we call district courts. Most district courts have a geographic 
area. Um, so for example, the entire state of Minnesota is a single district and there is a district court for the district of Minnesota. Um, Texas has multiple districts because we are very large, but you can draw those districts on a map. There are 94 geographic district courts, but then there are also some specialized courts, specifically the Court of International Trade, which obviously hears cases involving international trade, and then the Court of Federal Claims, which is a specific court that hears cases um, that are suits for money against the federal government. So if you're not just asking for the federal government to do a thing for you, but instead you actually are suing them for cash, um, in some cases you would want to go to the Court of Federal Claims instead of going to your regular um, sort of geographic district court. Um, in addition to the district courts, there are also some courts that are sometimes referred to as Article I courts. Um, these are courts that are not created under the umbrella of Article III. They are created for very specific purposes. And as a result, the way in which judges end up on these courts is not the method prescribed by Article III of the Constitution. So the sort of three major types of Article I courts. Um, one is the FISA court, which is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court. Um, this is sometimes jokingly referred to as the super secret court. Um, it is a court that only convenes to hear matters related to the surveillance of people under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So basically, when we want to spy on our own citizens, when we suspect that they are engaged in, for example, acts of terrorism, um, and we don't want them to know that we are spying on them, we want to keep it very secret that we are obtaining these warrants, um, there is a special court that, that the federal government can go to it's the FISA court. Um, the FISA court is actually made up of judges from Article III courts. So for example, one of the district court judges that I worked with in Minnesota, he wasn't my judge, uh, but one of the other judges was on the FISA court. He had a short appointment there. Um, justices or judges or justices uh, tend to sit on the FISA court for a few years. Um, and it's a court that only meets like maybe once a month or so. Uh, they get together, they hear whatever the federal government needs them to hear, and then they disperse again. Um, we also have federal bankruptcy courts. Bankruptcy courts, of course, are <laughs> very busy. Uh, bankruptcy courts hear bankruptcy matters. I guess that's pretty obvious. Um, and bankruptcy judges are um, hired Right, they are not, they don't go through the appointment and confirmation process that Article Three judges go through. It's much more of an administrative process to, to hire a bankruptcy judge. Um, and they tend to be uh, judges who have a particular interest in financial matters and accounting. Uh, there is sort of a specialized uh, knowledge base that is helpful if you want to be a bankruptcy judge. And they only hear that very specific type of case. They don't hear anything else. Finally, um, the federal court also has a system of magistrate judges. Uh, a magistrate judge is um, kind of a helper judge. Uh, the magistrate judges are hired by district court judges. So for example, there were, I think, four or five magistrate judges in the District of Minnesota, but instead of being appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate, the district judges in the District of Minnesota hired the magistrate judges. 
and the magistrate judges served a period of, of years and then they could reapply or they could step down. I don't think they ever told somebody they couldn't come back. Um, the magistrate judges handle a lot of matters that are cumbersome for district court judges. So for example, in a lot of criminal matters, the magistrate judges will hear evidentiary issues. Um, they will hold settlement negotiations between the, uh, the parties in civil matters. Um, so they hear a lot of, of sort of preliminary matters. And occasionally, if both parties agree to it, a magistrate judge can hear a civil matter, can hear a civil case. Um, and that sometimes happens if you have a civil case that's gonna go on for a very long period of time and you don't want to um, occupy a district court judge with that case for months and months and months and months, right? You want uh, the district court judges to be able to hear things as they're coming up. And so maybe a magistrate, the parties will agree to have a magistrate judge hear the case instead. So the district courts are trial courts. They're at the kind of bottom rung of the hierarchy with these Article I courts kind of filling in some gaps, hearing some very specific types of cases or some very specific types of motions um, to kind of provide support for the district court system. If you go up, one rung in the hierarchy of the federal courts, you come to the U.S. Courts of Appeals. The U.S. Courts of Appeals are, as the name suggests, appellate courts, which means that they don't hear cases um, as a matter of first instance. You don't bring your case directly to a court of appeals, with the exception of a couple of very specific types of cases. There are always exceptions. Um, but the federal courts of appeals, the US courts of appeals act as kind of a, a intermediary step between the district courts and the US Supreme Court. The US courts of appeals, uh, there are 12 regional circuits, which uh, I'll show you a map in just a moment. And then there's the federal circuit. Uh, the federal circuit is uh, nationwide and the federal circuit hears specific types of cases. Uh, most notably, they hear patent cases. Um, if you talk to any law clerk in the court system, and most judges, honestly, they will tell you that patent cases are their least favorite cases. And part of it is that it's very difficult to anticipate what the federal circuit is going to do. Um, so the federal circuit really, again, they hear more than patent cases, but the most, the bulk of their work is patent law cases. These are cases where somebody has infringed the intellectual property of, for example, um, you know, GE, right? Somebody's made a microwave that uses proprietary technology that GE uses in their microwaves. There might be a patent case. Okay. So this is a map of the US Circuit Courts of Appeals. And just to give you a little bit of a description um, for those of you who are using screen readers, uh, the United States is carved up into these circuits. So Texas, for example, is part of the Fifth Circuit, which is Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Te the Fifth Circuit used to be Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. But eventually the uh, workload of the Fifth Circuit became too large. And so, uh, the, so Congress did something called the circuit split, the Fifth Circuit split. And they broke the Fifth Circuit into two. So now Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi are the Fifth Circuit and Alabama, Georgia, and Florida are the 11th circuit. Um, there are some oddities on the map. Um, for example, the third circuit, which is Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, also includes the US Virgin Islands. 
And the first circuit, which is Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine, also includes Puerto Rico. Um, and then the ninth circuit is a total hodgepodge, um, Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, and Arizona. So right there, massive, right? Both in terms of geography, just physical space, but also in terms of the number of cases that they hear. California is a very busy area. Um, but the Ninth Circuit also includes Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, so it is vast. And there has been some discussion of possibly splitting the Ninth Circuit in much the same way that the Fifth Circuit was split in order to make it more manageable. Um, but, that, but that has not happened. You may be looking at this map and going, hey, wait, I thought she said there were 12 circuit courts of appeals and I only see 11 numbers. That's because the District of Columbia is very odd, right? The District of Columbia is not a state, but it, is a geographic area in the United States and it has people living there. And in fact, it has a lot of business because most of the federal agencies are there. So the District of Columbia, that, that geography is a district for district court purposes. So in the same way that the state of Minnesota is a district, Washington DC is also a district. The circuit court that oversees the District of Columbia is also the District of Columbia. It doesn't include any other geographic area. So in other words, the geographic um, reach of the district court and the circuit court of appeals is exactly the same. It's the District of Columbia. So the DC circuit um, is uh, actually a very powerful court because again, they hear a lot of appeals relating to federal agencies and uh, it is not uncommon for justices on the US Supreme Court to serve on the DC circuit first. Okay, let's talk about what the US Supreme Court does. Um, I. I think the Supreme Court is just the most fascinating group of people. Um, the US Supreme Court hears cases in a term that always begins on the first Monday in October and runs typically until the end of June. So the months of July, August, and September, they do not hear oral arguments on new cases. Um, instead, they're choosing cases for the next term. And then sometimes they are dealing with um, sort of emergency situations. This is also a pretty popular time for justices to retire. They will often retire if they have control over their schedule they don't die in the middle of their term. Um, they often retire at the end of June and then July, August and September provides an opportunity for the president to appoint somebody new and the, the Senate to confirm that person. Um, much of what the Supreme Court does is decide what they are going to decide. The vast majority of cases that the Supreme Court hears are on what is called a plenary docket. Plenary is P-L-E-N-A-R-Y. And it basically means optional. So the vast majority of cases that go to the Supreme Court are filed pursuant to a process called certiorari which again, we will address this much more at the end of the semester. Um, but these petitions for certiorari are basically, please, please hear my case, right? Supreme Court, I really want you to take this case. But the Supreme Court gets to decide which cases it's going to hear. And as we shall see in just a moment, 
um, they do not hear very many cases. Once they have decided to accept a case, it is usually set for oral argument. Oral argument occurs at the Supreme Court Mondays through Wednesdays. Um, there's a session in the morning and a session in the afternoon. Um, if your case is, is accepted by the Supreme Court and it, it goes um, to oral argument, usually, typically, each side gets 30 minutes. That may seem like a long time, but if you are an attorney representing a client who has a complex legal issue, 30 minutes is not that much time in which to make your argument. Um, and during that 30 minutes, you don't get to just talk, you also are answering questions. The justices interrupt you regularly, and sometimes they have conversations between themselves, and that is your time, right? It's not like the clock stops when the justices start to talk. So that 30 minutes tends to go very, very quickly. As a result, it's extraordinarily important for attorneys to convey the heart of their argument in their written briefs, because they may not get a chance to say all of the things they want to say. So they end up relying on those written briefs to make their case for them. After the justices hear oral arguments, they hold what's called conference, um, where they literally sit around a table. Um, their clerks, we'll talk about clerks in a minute, their clerks are not invited into conference. It is just the justices. And they go around the table and announce how they want to vote on the case. At that point, the most senior judge in the majority faction. So if, that, if, the, if the chief justice is in the majority, that's always the chief justice. Otherwise, it's whichever judge is in the majority who has been around the longest. That person decides who's going to write the opinion. They can assign it to themselves or they can assign it to somebody else. The majority opinion is as it suggests, the opinion that is actually signed on to or supported by a majority of the justices, so five or more. If you are on the other side, right, if you think the majority is getting it wrong, you can file what's called a dissent. And you can either join somebody else's dissent um, or someone can join your dissent or everybody can write their own. Um, <laughs> It all, it all works. Um, and the dissent is an opportunity for you to say why you think the majority is incorrect. Um, sometimes a decision by the Supreme Court does not achieve a majority, meaning there are not, we can't get five justices or more to sign on to a specific opinion. In that case, the most popular opinion on the winning side is called the plurality opinion. Um, and plurality opinions determine who wins and who loses, but they do not set precedent. Um, finally, there's something called a concurrence. So for example, let's say, um, let's say that, that um, the Mississippi abortion case it's decided by the Supreme Court in a couple of months. And maybe Justice Coney Barrett and Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and Alito all agree on the notion that the Mississippi um, abortion regulation is constitutional. And they all say, we would get rid of Roe versus Wade. But then maybe Justice Thomas and Chief Justice Roberts say, we think the Mississippi statute is constitutional, but we would not overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, they might instead, those two justices, write what's called a concurrence, saying, we agree with the outcome, but we disagree with the reasoning. 
This is important because what it would mean is that the Mississippi statute would continue to be enforced because you in fact have six justices who think that it's constitutional, but you only have four justices who want to overturn Roe versus Wade. And as a result, Roe versus Wade would remain good law. Okay, so the numbers here really matter. The last type of opinion that I want to mention is called a per curiam opinion. Um, sometimes the justices don't really feel the need to say a whole lot about a decision. And as a result, they may write what's called a per curiam opinion, um, where we don't even know which of the justices actually wrote it. Um, instead, it's just like typically a very short little thing that says, you know, if you read the case that we decided last term, you should know how this comes out, um, or obviously Joe should win. Um, usually procurium opinions are not very meaty, and we don't know how many justices sign on to them. We don't know, um, we don't know who wrote them. They tend not to provide a lot of reasoning. Um, it's really just a way to resolve the who wins and who loses part of a case without getting into reasoning. Okay, law clerks. So the vast majority of federal judges from the district court up through the Supreme Court have law clerks who work for them. Um, most state court judges do as well. Law clerks are usually recent law school graduates, uh, people who clerk in the district court or the U.S. Court of Appeals. Usually it's their first job out of law school. Um, Supreme Court typically hires people who have clerked for a couple of years at a lower court and then they hire um, somebody. So this is, again, though, that means that it's somebody who graduated from law school two years ago, right? Not very long. Uh, law clerks are, um, it tends to be a short-term job, usually like two to four years. And law clerks are responsible for doing research and writing for judges and justices of the Supreme Court. Um, it's an incredibly interesting job. Um, but it's a short-term job. It's not typically something that um, an attorney would do for their whole life. It's just a, a kind of an introductory position. But if you clerk, especially for the federal court, it can really increase your, um, your job opportunities and your earning potential after your clerkship. Okay. So workload, let's look at some actual numbers, just very briefly. Um, so these numbers are from 2018. Um, you can see that obviously the lowest level of courts hear the most cases. That's not surprising, right? Because this is where cases enter the process. And many of them enter at the district court level and end at the district court level. They aren't appeals. There's, there's nothing that happens after this. Um, as you can see the district court um, keeps track of how many of its cases are civil and how many are criminal. And in 2018, almost 300,000 civil cases were heard by district courts in the US. Only a little over, uh, only between 92 and 93,000 criminal cases were heard. So in other words, only about a quarter <laughs> of the district court's caseload is criminal matters. Most of its work is civil. The courts of appeals, um, there were in 2018, there were 48,486 court of appeals cases, um, which is not a small number, but it is certainly much smaller than the number of district court cases. So, you know, if we see that there are about 400,000 district court cases and not quite 50,000 court of appeals cases, that means about an eighth, right? The Supreme Court splits its docket into two categories, paid cases, 
where the party filing the petition has enough money to pay the court filing fee and unpaid petitions where the, um, the uh, party filing the petition is poor. They submit what's called an affidavit of indigency, which is a thing that says, I am poor, right? Um, I seem to have erased a digit. Uh, the Supreme Court received about 1,600 paid petitions in 2018. So in other words, 1,600 people paid money to ask the Supreme Court to pretty please hear their case. Um, just over 4,800 people submitted unpaid petitions. Again, I dropped a digit here. So it's just over 4,800. I'll correct this for the slides uh, before I post them. So if you add those together, right, you are at uh, about 6,500 petitions in 2018. Of those 6,500 petitions, the Supreme Court listened to oral argument on 73. From 6,500 to 73. Um, as you can see, much of the court's work is simply getting from 6,500 down to 73. And then they issued full opinions on 69 of those 73 cases. Okay, um, we are going to stop there and um, I will pick up talking about um, state courts uh, next time. Right.